All right, everyone. Welcome back to the Midwest Mountaineering Outdoor Adventure Expo. Uh, coming right up, we have uh, Superior to the Sea, uh, Jared Jared Munch presenting a 920-mile, 39-day stand-up paddleboard journey from Duluth to James Bay in Canada. Sounds epic and amazing. I'm really excited to watch some of the video clips and learn more about this kind of wild adventure. Um, be sure to drop some questions in in the chat box at the OutdoorAdventureExpo.com site. Uh, we'll get them answered uh, either during or towards the end of the show. There uh, should be plenty of time for questions. Um, and without further ado, take it away, Jared. All right. Thank you for having me, Adan. This is, once again, the presentation that I call Superior to Sea. And uh, what this journey was, was my 920-mile 39-day journey from Duluth to James Bay, uh, which you can see by my map in the left turn part of the screen. Uh, it originated in Duluth and ended about 920 miles paddling-wise uh, northeast of Duluth at James Bay, which is kind of geologically part of the North Atlantic slash Southern Arctic Ocean. But moving on, um, this was the first time this has ever been done on a paddleboard. This journey has been done numerous times in canoes, uh, meaning the Whitewater River portion was. Paddling whitewater, paddling canoe on Lake Superior isn't necessarily as heard of across the open bodies of water. Uh, but more on my particular aspect of the journey was I covered 920 miles over 39 days. The journey was sort of unsupported. And what I mean by that is I did all of the paddling by myself. I hauled all of my own food, but it's not by any means to say that I didn't receive any help along the way. Uh, typically when I was near civilization, people were willing to help me out. Everyone wants to feed me because I looked really skinny and really hungry most of the time because I was paddling 12 hours a day. And I did use the journey to raise over $1,400 for the neighborhood youth service. That money that was raised has been used to provide outdoor programming for kids in one of the Duluth area neighborhoods. And the most common question I get about the trip, I'll just answer it now, is how many times I fell. And it's only once and it wasn't even a good fall. It actually happened just after this picture was taken. It was windy and wavy and I was busy playing with my camera and just lost track of where my board was in relation to waves around me. Uh, the last thing I want you to take away before I really dive into details is this is not a glamorous story. It's not really a pretty story. Uh, people often think that I must have had a really great time. It must have been a really good vacation, but the brutal reality of doing something like this is you're sending yourself out to be really uncomfortable and really tired and miserable for a long time. So uh, without further ado, uh, here's a little bit more about myself. At the time of the journey, I was a master's engineering student at the University of Minnesota Duluth. On top of that, I was holding three other part-time jobs to help pay for my, quote, fun. And as I mentioned before, this wasn't necessarily fun, uh, but it was uh, a good thing to do with my life at that point in time. Uh, what I do right now currently is I'm working as a marine and coastal engineer where I work in and around water bodies, but more in a scientific sense versus a paddler and surfer sense. And I also own Superior Paddle Academy in Duluth where I teach advanced whitewater stand-up paddleboard, stand-up paddleboard racing, and all kinds of other wonderful things cool. about the finer aspects of stand-up paddleboarding. And oh, here you can see, this is how enthusiastic I was about grad school at the time of my journey. The metal hat on my head was about the most exciting thing to happen to me. <laughs> so the things that I'd like to talk about during the presentation start with my route my inspirations, and then the training and obstacles overcome. I'll talk about trip planning and departure. And then finally, I'll talk about the journey itself and wrap it up with some questions, comments, and uh, feel free to ridicule me. But one thing that I usually tell people is I spend a lot of time talking about things that happened before the journey, because in my opinion, planning and preparing to do something like this is the most difficult part of it, is building up the skills, the strength, and then of course, the, the courage to take on something like this. So beginning with my route, I brushed up on this before, but now I can give you some actual numbers to go by. 
starting with what I called part one, which is the red line starting in Duluth, goes across 450 miles of Lake Superior, which joins with the yellow line that is the Mishpacotan River. So the Mishpacotan River flows into Lake Superior. When I got to that point, I switched boards and I began paddling slash hiking and wading up about 60 miles of the Mishpacotan River until I got to the headwaters and hiked over a continental divide into the Missanabe River, which flowed about another 410 miles northeast to the ocean. One thing about the Missanabe River is at this point, I was in remote wilderness whitewater. Uh, there were long distances of flat water in between with long portages around big waterfalls. And my dad did join me for this final portion of the journey. Everything leading into this port, I was by myself. So people often ask me why I wanted to do this. Admittedly, it was mostly unintelligence and the fact that I'm possibly the most stubborn person you'll ever meet. Uh, but I also realized it was my last chance to do something like this. As I mentioned earlier, I was about to finish my master's degree and I really wanted a challenge and I wanted to do something different with my life. I was not necessarily satisfied for the same mundane experience of partying in college, getting a job, having a degree and having the cookie cutter lifestyle. I never really found that to be fulfilling for myself. So I decided to use paddling as an outlet to pursue my own passions and find my own lifestyle. One thing I wanted to do for years was straight up cross Lake Superior, which ultimately I couldn't do, but I was also given a guidebook that detailed the river route that I followed. And now the guidebook was super detailed and it was a huge part of my inspiration because it was this beautiful, perfectly laid out route that described in detail all of the rapids and the cultural significance of the journey. And then, of course, it's inspiring to break stigmas. Uh, there are a lot of negative stigmas around stand-up paddleboarding, particularly in the Midwest region where people lack really any exposure or knowledge to board sport culture or finer aspects of paddling skills. Uh, so I find um, a lot of satisfaction in breaking those stigmas and not only showing but proving what can actually be done on a stand-up paddleboard and then being able to relate that information to other people who are looking to break stigmas as well. Uh, I know the picture on the right probably isn't very tasteful, but I find it ironic. Uh, because I mentioned earlier, I wasn't satisfied with the same mundane experience of drinking and partying in college. Uh, that was actually possibly the only drink I ever had while I was in grad school is when I graduated. And the irony behind it is I absolutely hated grad school. It was horrific, but I got done and a photographer for the Duluth News Tribune happened to take a picture of me in the act. So that's my bit of humor. Uh, but I also got to paddleboard through the canal and the Lithbridge area in Duluth with my cap and gown. Nice. Uh, one thing that I find funny about this is that was, you know, a pretty standard operation for me, aside from the fact I was wearing a cap and gown, of course. Uh, but the amount of criticism that I received for doing that was astronomical. And I mentioned before, people in the Midwest generally lack exposure or knowledge to stand up paddle boarding or board sport culture. And in this instance of case, everyone thought I was going to kill myself and I was going to convince others to kill themselves too. Uh, when in reality, I'm paddling in like a, a piddly little two foot swell with a little bit of onshore wind. The wind was pushing me in through the canal and I was just riding out the waves. Uh, but as I mentioned before, people tend to react negatively to things that they don't understand and point fingers and take offense. So as I keep mentioning, I paddle because I like it, but I also paddle because it's enjoying to show people what the possibilities actually are and how to do it safely. Okay, so here's the, the guidebook that I had mentioned before. If anyone is interested in pursuing this route, uh, it's written by Half Wilson, he has numerous of published books detailing Ontario canoe wilderness routes. Uh, it had every piece of information I needed to paddle the Missanabe River. But I also mentioned very briefly earlier that I was interested in paddling across Lake yeah. Superior. So that's not following the perimeter of Lake Superior. I wanted to do open water crossings of the lake. Uh, there are actually uh, numerous races in Hawaii where 
professional paddlers paddle the channels between Hawaiian island chains. So I was hoping to do something similar on Lake Superior. Ultimately, it did not happen because I was unable to secure an escort boat to follow me across the lake. Now, that's how they do it in Hawaiian races. Paddlers have to hire a boat to follow them across. And I just couldn't find someone with the time and willingness to do it. So I ended up opting to follow the shoreline instead, which added a few extra hundred miles to my journey. But it wasn't necessarily a bad thing because the shoreline on the Canadian area is extremely beautiful. So people ask me, how did I train for this? The most honest answer is I didn't train a lot for it. And what I mean by that is the, the amount of paddling and physical training was minimal and it was a lot of mental training. Uh, mentally, I was banking on a lot of past experiences and planning to be uncomfortable for an extended period of time. And then also uh, lifting weights and being strong in the first place helps out a lot. But having the mental mindset and situational awareness is the most powerful thing that you can take into a journey or any kind of an endeavor like this. So I talked about how I already had a lot of skills. I'll describe what some of those are. I didn't just decide to do this journey. I was banking on confidence and skills gained from many past experiences. Those experiences included years of whitewater kayaking, whitewater canoe, and yes, whitewater stand-up paddleboarding. And then of course, years of surfing and subsurfing on Lake Superior. So through those, I had a lot of really nitty gritty technical paddling experience. And I had also done some other pretty long stand-up paddleboard journeys. When I decided that I wanted to start pursuing these endeavors, I borrowed a whole bunch of equipment and I paddled from Duluth to Grand Portage, which is the Canadian border of Lake Superior, which took six days and covered about 150 miles. I learned some really important things on this journey. The first thing was I shouldn't forget to bring a toothbrush when I go on these journeys. And uh, the second thing was bring more than one plastic spork because you'll definitely break it on the first day and have to eat everything with your fingers after that point. Uh, so uh, moving on, uh, a year after I did that journey, I departed from Duluth once again and paddled 1300 miles over 50 days around the circumference of Lake Superior. Uh, I have a different presentation for that journey, which closely parallels with this one. The big takeaway of that journey was the lake was really calm every day and I just got really bored during it. Now you can only take the same forward stroke so many times for so many days in a row before you almost lose your sanity. And then when I decided that I was interested in pursuing this new route of paddling 400 plus miles of the remote whitewater in the Missinabi River, I realized I needed to develop a new type of skill set. And that skill set was whitewater stand-up paddleboard touring. So learning once again how to properly outfit a board. And then of course, paddle a whitewater board with all of the gear. So that journey took me down the Steel River, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a moment. But before I do that, I'm going to talk about stand-up paddleboard surfing. More specifically, sup surfing. So what we're really doing when we're surfing or we're subsurfing is we're building a highly refined board skills and highly refined paddling skills. We're finding comfort in being pushed around by big wind and water. And we're also becoming acquainted with near shore currents during storms and wavy conditions. Now, the reason that this is really powerful is when I find myself paddling a 14 foot board loaded with another 50 pounds of gear and it's wavy, you find that you have to be very selective about where you can even get to and from shore. And then of course, once you're near shore and the waves are breaking around you, how are you going to manage your board and your gear to keep your equipment from being damaged or worse yet yourself from becoming hurt? So that all really goes and I talk a lot about really nitty gritty paddling skills, which I think a lot of people often overlook and they think more specifically on paddling endurance, but my take is you have to be very skilled and be very acquainted with 
the situational weather and the hydrodynamic conditions around you if you're hoping to achieve something like uh, an extended length stand-up paddleboard journey. Okay, so building on whitewater, I talked about surfing. I did years of whitewater, whitewater kayak, whitewater canoe, and eventually merging into whitewater stand-up paddle, which is an amazing mix of canoeing and surfing skills. It's one of the hardest things to learn on a paddleboard, uh, but having the skills, they apply to every single other aspect of paddling. You can learn how to manage and maneuver a board in rapids and currents. You can apply that to wind, waves, or even just apply some of those same strokes to a general flat water environment to enhance your paddling experience. Now I mentioned it's cold surfing Lake Superior. This is a photo of me a few years ago. As you can see, I get covered in ice. And one of the large difficulties that I face is the shaft of my paddle gets covered in ice. So you can imagine how clumsy I am on the water trying to hold a slippery paddle while balancing on a very tiny board, paddling into waves and surfing them. It's not really a, a glorious experience, but it is a fun experience nonetheless, and it makes you a much stronger surfer and paddler in the process. Getting back to the Steel River journey, this was that whitewater river loop I had talked about. What I learned on this one was uh, be comfortable portaging a lot and being safe while portaging in the woods. The nature of the Steel River is, it's about a 110 mile loop that actually starts and ends in the exact same place, but there are some brutal portages in it. I learned about portaging and more importantly, I learned about how to paddle a whitewater stand-up paddleboard when it's fully loaded in gear. And what I mean by that is when we talk about whitewater stand-up paddleboard, what makes it really powerful to us is we have the ability to move our feet back and forth along the deck and manually change the trim of the board. This is something that you can't necessarily achieve in a kayak or canoe, but you can totally do it on a stand-up paddleboard and it really opens up a lot of opportunity for you. The problem with this is when you put another 50 pounds of gear on the front of the board in front of you, you can't really pivot the board around as easily anymore. So here in this video, you'll see me going down a rapid and I can see there's a rock somewhere out ahead of me and I'm just not able to work my way around it. So there you can see me kind of going head over heels. I just fall onto the board in front of me. So lesson learned, you, you have to be very selective about what sorts of rapids you go down with a fully loaded board. Outside of paddling skills, I did an extraordinary amount of push-ups and weight training. In this video, I had a dog for a few weeks who was my weightlifting partner, but I did like before the journey, I hardly did any paddling. That's not to say I didn't have any paddling skills because I had tons of experience from the past. But when I considered myself training specifically for this journey, I hardly paddled at all. I banked on experience from the past and I lifted weights and I got strong. I did have some pretty bad complications mm. during my training. A uh, thing one that happened to me is while I was teaching a class at UMD, a student spilled a can of hot asphalt binder, which is tar, down my heat resistant glove and burned all the skin off my forearm. And then one week before I was supposed to leave for the journey, I was delivering a canoe to my dad's house, which he was going to use on the river with me. And someone just straight up rear-ended me going down the highway. During the process of this, a metal bed frame that I had in the back of my vehicle got shoved forward as the back of the vehicle caved in and it punched through the seat of my vehicle. The only thing that stopped it from like going through my back was that this piece of metal bed frame actually got hung up on a piece of metal spring material in the back of my seat. So I didn't get impaled, but I was pretty banged up from this. I uh, basically couldn't really stand or walk for a couple days following it. And I had to push my departure back by about two more weeks than I had anticipated. So now when I talk about how hard this was mentally, I had these two big things happen. I was also recovering from 
a pretty bad ankle injury because one of my friends thought it was going to be funny to kick me one time and actually hurt me pretty badly. So I had all sorts of really weird things happen to me <laughs> leading into this, but eventually I got my board ready and I got to the water. Now, speaking of getting a board ready, there are all sorts of paddle boards available on the market right now. Uh, but the thing that seems to get overlooked by most people is the extreme uniqueness of different paddle boards in terms of shape, volume, and more importantly, the width of a board. And what I find is uh, someone looking to do a long journey needs to be very particular about what board they're looking for. And what advertisers like to do is advertisers like to oversimplify things and market one board for everybody, which uh, it's really a disservice to people looking to take on the sport because everyone is different in terms of height, weight, and paddling ability level. So what I always tell people is boards don't come ready for these types of adventures. And if they do, they quote, quote, they suck. Meaning don't be willing to settle for something just because it says it comes ready for an adventure. Uh, if you're really serious about doing it, you should find a board that is specific to the type of haul you want, the width you want, and then do all the aftermarket work yourself and set your deck rigging up specifically to the size of board, the size of packs you're bringing and how you want your deck layout to be. So here I am, I just got a brand new board and I'm actually installing a secondary fin box into the front of it. So I have my little Dremel tool there and I'm just just cutting a giant hole straight into my brand new board. I had never even gotten it in the water before cutting a huge hole in it. I like to tinker with equipment, if you can't tell. Uh, but when we talk about putting equipment, more necessarily gear, on a stand-up paddleboard, we have to think really specifically about how the wind is going to affect us once we start loading a whole bunch of extra surface area onto the deck. I have an equation here. I, I'm not going to spell it out for you. What I want your take home message to be is if you're looking to put gear on a board and go on a big adventure, you have to be willing to use at least half of your brain to have a good outcome. So in this simple diagram, we have wind hitting the board from the side. The pivot point of the board, roughly speaking, it's where the fin is in the back. And in this case, the wind is hitting from the left. So the nose of the board wants to drift to the right. Now, what happens in the next slide, when we put dry bags and more surface area on the front of the board, the wind has more leverage. So the board wants to turn more and more in the wind. So being willing to understand this, it enables a paddler to optimize how they're placing the bags on the deck. People tend to think more specifically in weight distribution, but actually your distribution of surface area in relation to a crosswind is the single most important thing that you can do when putting equipment on a paddleboard. And that's a bit different to a canoe because with a canoe, you can put a whole bunch of gear inside. It's not going to change your surface area because your gunnels are coming the whole way up over the gear, almost no matter what you're doing anyway. But while I'm talking about a canoe, there's a very huge difference in the way a canoe works versus how a paddleboard works. And that is with a canoe, your pivot point is generally near the bow, possibly where your bow paddler is sitting. And that's because the bow is being pinched by oncoming water, whereas the stern is in loose water that's already been churned up by the bow. On a stand-up paddleboard, the opposite is happening. On a stand-up paddleboard, the nose is kind of skimming over water and the tail is actually held in place by fin. So in a lot of instances, the way you paddle a stand-up paddleboard versus the way you paddle a canoe are completely opposite of each other. And that's something that a lot of canoeists don't realize. And when they try to apply their canoeing skills to a stand-up paddleboard, it just doesn't work. So here's a quick explanation. It doesn't work because they're two completely different beasts altogether. Now, I talked about being specific about placing gear on a board. Here is what my touring setup looked like on Lake Superior. What I tried to do was tuck gear that was in front of me as close to me as possible to minimize how much leverage the wind had as it pushed my board around. And you'll see I even got a board 
all the way back behind me. This board is actually behind the fin and behind the pivot point. So what I'm achieving by that is when wind is hitting me, this orange bag in the back is actually helping me more than hurting me. I also had a goofy three-piece spare paddle that I retrofitted as a camera mount and took a whole bunch of really bad selfies the whole way I went around the lake. Uh, but the takeaway is I was really picky about how I put gear on the board. And I was also picky about how I strapped it down, not just in terms of spatial awareness, uh, but how strong were my tie downs actually being? Because as you can see, I was paddling open water on Lake Superior, going through big waves, water always crashing over the board. And I had to be really confident that my tie downs were going to be secure because having tie down points break a mile offshore and losing equipment was simply unacceptable in my case. Okay, so that was a lot about pre-trip preparations. Uh, I am having a, a really weird echo on my end right now. So uh, I'm just gonna take a pause. Adon, have there been any questions yet that I, you would like me to answer? Jared, can you hear me? Spatial awareness. Jared, can you hear me? I, I do hear you, Adon. Okay, yeah. I haven't seen any questions come up as of yet. Um, and I, I don't hear an echo, at least on the, on the, on the live output. Okay. Yep. I still have the echo. I'll just turn my volume down again. I'll keep moving on. All right. Sounds good. <clears throat> okay. So I talked a lot about pre-trip preparations. Uh, now I get to talk about the actual journey itself. So mentally what I did to help myself comprehend the magnitude of what I was about to take being 920 miles was I mentally broke the trip up into sections. My first section was 120 miles from Duluth to Grand Marais. This section, you would think of it as being what should be the easiest part of the lake because there, there are parks everywhere, there are people with homes everywhere. You don't necessarily feel like you're paddling alone in the wilderness, which gives you a good sense of relief, uh, but it does have some difficulties associated with it. Uh, one particular thing in my case was the day I left, it was like almost the worst day I paddled the whole journey. I was paddling straight into a 10 to 15 mile an hour headwind. All day I made it from Duluth to just past the town of Two Harbors. Uh, by the time I stopped, uh, it was pretty ironic. My GPS told me I had gone 26.1 miles that day. Uh, so I couldn't quite make marathon length. But what was really great about that first day is uh, my body felt strong despite the tough conditions which was really good because I was still extremely hesitant at the time from that vehicle incident that I had mentioned earlier where I was rear-ended and had the back injury. So this, it was a bad day altogether, but it was really confidence inspiring and it helped me actually look forward to the rest of the journey versus being scared out of my mind about the rest of the journey. I was relieved to be on the water, but mentally exhausted just because of all of the things that happened leading into that. And I guess I didn't mention this. If anyone's planning to do a trip like this, plan on having all of your stuff ready for the trip at least two weeks before you go, because that'll give you time to take care of all of the things that you realized you forgot while you're getting everything ready. Uh, in this case, I had a really awesome nap in two harbors. I just had to throw that into the presentation because it was amazing. But I want to talk a little bit about how I prepared my route. If anyone has ever seen Lake Superior, I'm guessing most of you have, you understand that the northern yeah. side of the lake doesn't have a lot of beautiful beach access. Okay. It's mostly bedrock with giant cliffs going straight into the water, which is beautiful to see from the water, but it presents a lot of limitations in terms of actually getting out of the water. So what I did when I was getting ready for this journey was I utilized a mix of satellite images, topo maps, a whole bunch of online resources. And I just zoomed in across all of Lake Superior. I compared satellite images with topo maps and I kind of picked out every place that looked like it was either flat land, a river mouth or a sandy or gravel beach. And I had those locations pinpointed and on hard copy paper maps I carried with me. 
as well as download it onto a GPS device. So within the GPS device, I was able to locate the mileage between all of these locations, which was really awesome for me because I, I'm guilty of kind of pushing the boundaries a little bit in terms of nightfall. I'm sure as most of you are aware, it's generally calmer as the sun goes down. So it's nice to get some miles in when the lake isn't as crazy. So I would have these locations in the back of my mind and know that I could paddle for another hour and potentially come across two or three different places that appeared to be campable uh, versus some other instances. I might know that it's just straight up cliffs for the next five miles in a row and there's no place to get to shore. So I might end my day early. So that helped me a lot in my case and it can help anyone out is simply knowing what your route looks like and what the land features are and being aware of where you can potentially get out of the water if you need to. I kind of talked about all these already. So here we go. This first part of the lake from Duluth to Grand Marais, I mentioned the first day was kind of brutal going into a headwind. I had like just perfect glassy water the next few days in a row. At one point, I did encounter a deer swimming about a quarter mile offshore. It appeared to be swimming from the Minnesota shoreline to the Wisconsin shoreline. I encountered it in the water and kind of yeah. herded it back into shore. Yes, I'm not sure what the, the proper thing to do is when you find a deer that's apparently lost in the middle of Lake Superior, but I got it back to shore and that was pretty cool to watch it swim. It got out of the water and ran inland like it wasn't even tired. It's pretty wild how strong those animals are, but it was calm weather. So I got a lot of easy miles which I appreciated after that first day where I was working really hard into the headwind. I mentioned the Minnesota shoreline is populated. So for me, it meant that I got to visit friends. More importantly, I got fed really well. And I don't wanna sound like a sucker for food, but I am when I'm doing things like this because when you're paddling 12 to 15 hours a day, it's almost impossible to eat enough food to keep up with the calorie intake. So what I tried to do was I like, I was overweight before I started the trip and I was underweight by the time I got done. But while I was around food, I was eating all the food that I could to try to maintain to the best of my ability. So here's just a couple pictures from this first portion of the lake. This first one on the left, this is taken in Tedaguch State Park. It's a really narrow slot wall I bet a lot of people paddle past it without even realizing it's there, but it's a really cool spot. And then this on the right is the mouth of the Manitou River, which is a phenomenal place to get to. The downside of it is you have to be willing to paddle about a 15 mile day to get to it because there's no public access within about seven miles. Wow. Here's what that first portion of the journey looked like for me. Okay, so that was part one. Uh, part two of this journey took me from Grand Marais to the town of Terrace Bay in Canada. If you map it, it's a little over 200 miles. I cheated a lot during this section, to be honest. I didn't follow shoreline even closely. I cut across every bay and island that I could, and I turned it into about 150 miles. Uh, it was 10 days total of that seven was on the water. And three were wind bound where I was basically just using wind as an excuse to stay in Grand Marais and eat donuts. Uh, but the remaining days, I actually had downwind conditions. And I'll talk quite a bit about downwind and what that actually means for a stand up paddler. It's not just going downwind, it's much, much more than that. So before I talk about the amazing downwind, I'm gonna talk about my day of the border crossing. And in this case, I had been hanging out in Grand Marais for about three days, waiting for just a, a really tough headwind to pass. And following the headwind was what appeared to be a nice tailwind, which I obviously love because I like having a 
good free push. But what ended up happening was the forecast kind of blew up overnight before my departure. And what was supposed to be a nice five to 10 mile an hour tailwind very quickly escalated into much more than that. It was 15 to 20 gusting above that. And yeah, where I was uh, near Grand Ray on the Canadian border, it meant that wind had about 150 miles of open water to blow across before reaching me, which obviously meant big waves. I was in sustained two to three foot waves, building three to four and occasionally five plus in and around cliffs where it was refracting off of walls. Uh, during this day, I covered about 36 miles in just nine hours. And uh, my saving grace in this day was a landowner had actually messaged me on the GPS device I was carrying. And she had mentioned that she had a vacant lot inside of a protected bay just past the Canadian border. And I ended up uh, staying there because that was the only place that I could even think of getting out of the water at because every place else was just waves detonating onto bedrock or against cliff faces. So here's what that looked like. The unfortunate thing about having a camera on the board is of course the waves never look as big as they really are, but you can definitely tell how I'm falling down into the troughs of waves during this. So this was just before the Canadian border in a place where I actually had to paddle across the waves rather than directly down them, which is extremely challenging to do for a long period of time. You can see my legs working pretty hard there. But following this day, I had a lot of days of just a fun, manageable downwind. So what we're doing when we're paddling downwind on a stand-up paddleboard is we want to stand because our body is effectively a sail pushing us downwind. But when you're paddling downwind in an open body of water that has enough fetch to generate significant wind and wave conditions, what we find is we can actually use the waves to our advantage as well. Uh, this is, you'll see Hawaiian downwind races all the time, any in ocean environment, even in some river environments, people do this phenomenon called downwinding. And I play this video, you can see, I'm looking for a trough to open up in front of me, and then I'm accelerating forward. And you can see how my board is constantly accelerating right now. I'm barely even paddling because the wave behind me is pushing me forward in addition to the wind pushing me forward. So when you get in these kinds of conditions, a stand-up paddler has a really big advantage because we're getting a really big push from the wind since our body is a sail. And then of course we can move our feet back and forth along the deck of the board to change the trim and help angle the board down into waves in the first place to catch them and ride with them. So really fun thing to do. It has its own unique set of challenges, but it was a really good treat for me because I turned what would be a really mundane experience of paddling and logging a bunch of flat water into something that was actually really, really fun to do. So I had just a few days of this where it was just phenomenal lining up perfectly for me. So by doing that and having those conditions, I covered this stretch from Grand Marais to Terrace Bay in just a few days of short work. I was constantly going across a big open water. Let's see, I, here we go. Here's the route that I took. So you can see I'm very rarely near shore. I'm mostly out in open water taking the shortest route that I can possibly find across bays between island chains. But what was great was the wind was pushing me the entire time. Okay, so that there's the town of Terrace Bay right there where I mentally concluded this portion of the journey. Once again, I turned about 240 miles into 150. There was one really weird location that I found during this. And actually when I paddled around Lakes Pier, I had a, a similar thing happen at this location. So I'm just gonna touch up on it. Uh, maybe someone in my audience is planning their own journey on Lakes Pier. I want you to take special note of this because there are some really interesting coastal conditions at play in this area. So I am 
at Nipigon Bay. In the bottom left of my screen, this picture I have, that's Nipigon Bay. And the main body of Lake Superior is to the south, and we're being separated by St. Ignis Island, Simpson Island, and a few other islands. But what's really happening in this location is Nipigon Bay is shallow and therefore has a lot of warm water. Warm water means generally warmer air above the water. Then we have the main body of Lake Superior, which is deep and characterized by cold water. And if you know anything about thermodynamics, you know that cold doesn't blow towards hot. Hot air blows to cold air. And what that meant in these conditions was, even though I had a prevailing wind direction of moving west to east, pushing me the way I wanted to go, in these channels between Nipigon Bay and Lake Superior, there was a wind funneling out. And when I say funneling, I actually mean blasting out of here. So I would get somewhere within the channel and suddenly the wind direction would change and it would be pushing me out into the body of Lake Superior. And along with that came a really disorienting wave direction. I went from having almost like a nice corduroy of waves, like how you would think of a, a nicely groomed ski hill, into just random giant pyramids of water. So I mentioned again, extremely disorienting and a, a very easy place for an, a less experienced person to put themselves in serious harm's way because there are so many different conditions factoring in these locations. So take note of it here. You could have these same kind of conditions really anywhere where you have the different bodies of water with the potential for wind funneling between them. Okay, so moving on to the next portion of the journey, this is what I called section three. This took me from Terrace Bay to the Mishpacotan River. It was my final portion of the journey on Lake Superior. Uh, if you route it out, it's about 175 miles by shoreline. I once again cheated. I cut across every bay and island that I could. So I turned it into about 150 miles. During this, I had a, a really fun mix of conditions, a lot of fog, which I actually really enjoy when I'm going on long journeys because my eyes don't get fatigued paddling in fog. It's really soothing. Uh, I broke a personal record and at the end of it all, I got called an idiot by a uh, sea kayaking outfitter, which kind of really got me all fired up because I, I talked about the stigmas around stand-up paddle boarding and how people like to react negatively to, towards things they don't understand. Uh, this is just a case in point of that. It was mostly in good fun uh, that I was called an idiot, but it's still called an idiot nonetheless. So a couple things that happened during this portion I mentioned mixed conditions. Once again, I spent a couple days in Terrace Bay waiting for the perfect weather to show up. And then the day of the weather just didn't turn out any way the way I was hoping for it to. So what I was hoping to do uh, leaving from Terrace Bay is, let's see, got my laser pointer here. So here's Terrace Bay. I was hoping to cut across this bay and cut across this bay, maybe even get out to Pick Island here and cut across Pick Island all the way over to uh, the Lake Superior. No, this is the Puckasaw Provincial Park headquarters. The wind looked like it was going to allow me to do that. And in the process, I would have saved about a full day of paddling, but the wind direction shifted about 90 degrees from what it was supposed to be. So what ended up happening to me in this day was I got to the lake, and as soon as I saw the water, I knew it was bad. There was a super thick fog already rolling in. And I ended up paddling about 10 miles that day with just a wind hitting me at 90 degrees. It was bitter cold and foggy. So I didn't make it very far that day. And in the process, I got pushed way inside of the bay. I ended up sleeping on a sand beach right here where my laser pointer is right now. And got pretty beat up, but I ended up sleeping about 12 hours on the beach only to be waking up about every 30 minutes by a, a really angry sounding beaver that had a place like right next to where my tent was, I think. Uh, but I got up super early the next day and ended up kind of making up my miles. But I don't know, certain things about that day just really beat me up mentally because it being secluded in Lake Superior in the cold and the fog is 
uh, pretty tough mentally. But following that, I had almost perfect conditions. So I talked about downwind paddling once again, had some flat water and dense fog. It was the perfect mix of fun conditions, easy conditions, and soothing conditions. And what that ultimately meant for me was at the end, the ideal day conditions, they prevailed through the night. So I still had some waves rolling in when I was trying to paddling, which made it really disorienting uh, to paddle when you can't see where the waves are because it's dark outside. But uh, the reason I was trying to paddle when it was dark was because this was my final stretch on Lake Superior and I just wanted it to be over. I wanted to get off the lake while there was still good weather to be had. So here is what this portion of the journey looked like for me. Um, fun conditions, easy conditions, and soothing conditions. And what that ultimately meant for me was at the end, the ideal day conditions. Oh, I can hear it. Okay, now. Tonight, I still had some waves rolling in when I was kind of paddling, which made it really disorienting. Paddling the waves out. Okay. Waves out. Okay. But uh, the reason I was trying to paddle when it was dark was because this was my final stretch on Lake Superior. Talk about downwinding. Here it is again, getting some free rides and some free distance off of the wind and wave pattern. Yeah. <laughs> Talk about downwinding. Here it is again, getting some free rides and some free distance off of the wind away pattern. Okay, so that was all of Lake Superior. Uh, now, I'm to the point where I needed to swap out into a different board. This was at the mouth of the Michipicotan River. Uh, essentially, I swapped out into a board more suited for the destructive nature of river paddling. And now here's what that part of the journey looked like for me. Really? Wow. This is two days of walking up a riverbed. Okay, so that was all of Lake Superior. Uh, now, I'm to the point where I needed to swap out into a different car. This was at the mouth of the Michigan River. Uh, essentially, I swapped out into a board more suited for the destructive nature of river paddling. And here's what that part of the journey looks like. How do you mention my Okay, so at the end of that last video, I was redoing the outfitting on my board. I mentioned this earlier, it's the idea of maintaining the ability to sink the tail of the board and properly maneuver the board, despite having a whole bunch of extra gear weight onto it. And what I found when I was going off the Missinot or the Michipicote River was I was too nose heavy and I couldn't pick the front of the board up over the water to maneuver it. So when my dad met me, he had a spare parts and repair kit with him that I used to undo all of my outfitting and then reassemble it while being destroyed by mosquitoes. I ended up having to do this twice. The first time the glue failed because 
an acetone seeped into the patch area from the surrounding deck pad material. It ended up getting it all fixed with about some of my last few drops of glue without really breaking into my emergency reserves. But here's what my optimized and let's say quote optimized because when you put this much gear on a board, it's not going to be optimal no matter how you put it down. <laughs> but this is what it looked like for me. So in this case, you can see that I'm not really concerned with how wind is hitting me because I'm paddling in a shelter, sheltered river corridor. So I don't have necessarily the exposure to wind hitting me from the side. But I tried to pull the gear back as close to me as possible. I did refrain from putting a back onto the tail of the board because I wanted to leave the tail of the open, I wanted to leave the tail of the board reserved for me getting my foot onto, uh, which you can see in the far left picture, how I like to put a foot on the back of the board to sink it down and maneuver with. So mention a different board. Here's what the two different boards look like. On the left, this is my lake touring board. It was 14 feet long, 25 inches wide, not a whole lot of rocker. It's more of like a, a performance racing board. And my Whitewater River board, this is a 12 and a half foot by 30 inch wide inflatable board. Inflatable because it's much more suited for the destructive nature of river paddling. And it also had a lot more rocker to it, which was going to help me in maneuvering because I needed all the help I could get with all of the gear I was putting onto the deck. So here's what the first portion of the Misanabe River looked like. Now, once again, my dad was with me during this portion. And this photo here, this is taken at the entrance of the Height of Land Portage, which is about a 200 yard portage from the Great Lakes Drainage Basin into the Arctic Drainage Basin. The really disappointing thing about it is it's called Height of Land. Uh, but as you can see from the picture, you're kind of in a swampy, low lying area. I, I had joked with myself before getting there that I wanted big mountains and scenery, but it just didn't happen. Uh, following in over the height of land portage, we went down uh, miles, hundreds of miles of narrow river corridor, gradually widening uh, with uh, additional confluences, of course. And we we're going down hundreds of class one rapids, uh, many class two and portaging anything three or above, uh, mm -hmm. because my personal theory is whenever you're in a really remote wilderness setting, the ante is really upped uh, with whichever class rapid you're running. And then of course, having not really an ideal river running setup uh, also adds to the difficulties involved. Uh, but here are some quick notes. My dad, he, he's not a whitewater canoeist. He's not a whitewater kayaker. He wouldn't really associate himself as a whitewater anything, uh, but he had agreed to do this journey with me. Uh, and I thank him deeply for that because I really was in need of a paddling partner. So we had a really interesting dynamic between us. And that was, I was sort of teaching and guiding him down the river, but in a very informal sense, because we also wanted to make good time and not be stuck on the river for weeks longer than it needed to be just for the sake of him having a, a really detailed learning experience. So the the kind of strategic nature of my teaching did lead to uh, numerous incidents where the canoe is flipped over. Uh, and this happens whether you're teaching or giving bad instruction, people flip canoes over. It's not the end of the world. Uh, what is the end of the world is if you manage the cleanup poorly. And what I found was the stand up paddleboard was an extremely functional rescue watercraft because on the stand up paddleboard, I could jump off my board onto any rock I found in the river and utilize the rock as a, a good solid foundation to get hands on canoe, hands on a paddler. I could even just roll the canoe over my board in open water to dump water out of it. Uh, super, wow. super functional. Uh, the other thing that was nice is, as you can see in the picture on the right, when it's downpouring, a, a canoe fills with water. Same thing happens in a big rapid, canoe fills with water doesn't happen on a paddleboard. The paddleboard is always, always shedding water off of the deck. So there were many instances where I found the paddleboard was much more functional than the canoe. Uh, last big instance was when you're standing on a paddleboard, you can see 
way more than you can while sitting in a canoe. And this played into effect for us a lot. On some rapids and even the, about the final 75 miles of the journey where the river was really shallow, I was the only one who could see where to go and how we could find a, a deep channel of water to paddle in. In most instances, when it was shallow, my dad just had to follow me and couldn't really make any decisions for himself, which I could definitely feel his frustration for, but he just couldn't see anything sitting down in the canoe where I could see the whole river from standing up about three feet higher than he was sitting. So with that said, uh, here's what the first portion of the Missanabe River looked like for us. In bigger rapids, I would often portage a pack or two to the bottom and then run the rapid just to take a little bit of gear weight off of my deck. Which is what you've been doing for a long time, pretty much just catching time. Mm -hmm. I'm just generally furious. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay, so at the end of that video, you saw me both stand up paddling and canoeing down that last rapid. And that's a, an approach that my dad and I used frequently on larger rapids. It, the scenario would be, I would tell dad either follow me down the rapid or go to the portage trail, in which case he would go to the portage trail. I would paddle down the rapid and then run back up the portage trail and paddle the canoe down while he carried a pack or two down. We were both happy because he didn't have to push his level of comfort any more than he already was. And I was happy because I wanted to paddle down those rapids twice because they were really fun. <laughs> so we both got to benefit from this and it actually helped our timeline quite a bit because we were able to move really quickly and effectively in this manner. So the next section of the river, this is from the town of Matisse all the way to Moose Factory. Well, where we ended, it's actually called Moose Factory Island, which is an island in the, what's called the Moose River. And a uh, land side of the island is a town called Moosany, where we eventually got on a train and went back home with. But this portion of the journey, it was about 150 miles over five days. We had some brutally long portages. And then the river began to widen. It widened significantly as we dropped off of the Canadian Shield onto the Hudson Bay Lowlands, where it turned into more of a braided channel. And I mentioned earlier the benefit of me being on a paddleboard and being able to see everything. This is where it really came into effect because it was a super shallow braided channel with uh, basically a maze to work your way through. A couple things about this portion. I mentioned the long portage. If there's any rapid that anyone's ever heard of on the Missinabi River, it's Thunderhouse Falls, uh, which is about a one and a half mile portage, I believe, around. The really weird thing that, well, not weird, but something that my dad and I joked about was when we were on the portage, we saw a camp of uh, canoeists with uh, some canvas coated cedar strip canoes. We talked to the camp counselors and I believe they told us the canoes weighed about 200 pounds each. Uh, and then they didn't have anything that looked lightweight in their camp. So while we were struggling to get down the shallow water towards the end of the river, uh, we couldn't imagine how that group was going to do. 
because we were scraping over everything with our lightweight equipment. And we knew that they were going to be sinking a lot deeper than we were. And at the same time, when we talked to the camp, they had described being done with the river in six days. And we just couldn't fathom how they were going to achieve that. Now we'll get back to that later on because they ended up making it uh, sort of, it was really miraculous. Uh, but this picture on the right, it's the last night camping of the journey. This was actually the day of my 26th birthday. And it was a good day. Um, I, yeah, nothing went wrong with that day. It was a really nice sandy spot to camp. But this is our general setup, um, canoe, paddleboard, two tents, the paddleboard kind of often doubled as like a, a cooking surface or however else we could make it be multifunctional. But the other thing that happened on this portion of the journey was uh, somewhere on a rapid or somewhere in a portage, I hit a rock pretty hard and I was losing about three pounds of air pressure every day. So during the, I, during the trip, I had a tiny sized pump. I would spend about 15 minutes every morning a reinflating a few extra pounds of air pressure into the board. It was kind of my daily ritual. Uh, and then I mentioned navigating shallow water. Here's another instance where we're just scraping over shallow stuff for miles and miles on end. Here is uh, one of my final strokes as I got to the ocean at James Bay. And here's my obligatory selfie at the ocean. This is what that portion of the journey actually looked like. I don't always provide commentary while I'm going down rapids, but I don't know, I guess I did in that case. I do like to show this portion at the end of it all. I could deflate my board, roll it up, and just stick it on a train. Uh, a lot less of a hassle than putting a canoe on a train. <laughs> Uh, within 36 hours of being back home, I traveled to Wisconsin and won a stand-up paddleboard race. The following day, I went and participated in a whitewater kayaking event where I found some of my former whitewater stand-up paddleboard students and decided to go paddle the river with them. And at this point in time, I was just completely exhausted out of my mind, not thinking clearly. I neglected to wear any of my knee pads and then try to paddle down a rapid that had almost no water flowing through it. And I crashed into rock and put a bunch of stitches right below my kneecap. So I went from paddling 39 days, almost a thousand miles in remote wilderness without any incident to significantly injuring myself immediately when I got home. <laughs> now, I have two, two more parts coming up here. I have questions, comments, and ridicule. Uh, and then for anyone who wants to stick around after any questions, comments, and ridicule, I have a fun video that I prepared of winter stand-up paddleboard touring on Lake Superior. Uh, really fun video, kind of funny too. And then I also have a video of whitewater stand-up paddleboarding. And this is 
on a proper whitewater stand-up paddleboard without a whole bunch of gear on the deck. So you can see what kind of rapids we can actually go down with the whitewater stand-up paddleboard. Uh, but before I do that, I would like to open this up to any questions, comments, or ridicule that people have. I still do have about a 15 second lag on my end where I can hear my echo. So I'll, I'll shut up for a little bit and then wait for a question to come through. Hey, Jerry, can you hear me? I do hear you. Excellent. All right. Um, I have a Madison and I actually came up with a few questions here. Uh, we're both uh, very uh, um, experienced paddlers, but we had some, I had a question regarding sort of how you approached your layering. I saw that you're wearing in some, you know, full on dry suits. And, and in some cases, um, I think when you switch boards, I saw a shot like a blue sort of sun hoodie, just how you combated the sort of you know the overheating because supping is a very physical active um uh, output of energy and just trying to you know maintain that how did you facilitate that yeah that's a really good question and it's it's a tough one for me to answer because i do a lot of different things this journey that i just detailed i was wearing a dry suit across all of lake superior and then i swapped out of the dry suit when I was away from the cold water environment. Uh, but it wasn't necessarily cold every day I was on Lake Superior. So what I find myself doing a lot of the time uh, would be I might have the dry suit on in the morning and evening and during midday when the sun was out, I would just have like the dry suit pants on and I would have the entire torso part of the dry suit unzipped and just tied around my waist. Uh, under nice. the dry suit, I was generally wearing like the thinnest base layers that I have. The, the dry suit does hold in a lot of heat, so yeah. you're right. It's easy to overheat in them. Uh, I guess the one saving grace I had was if I ever did feel overheated, I could always just like zip the suit up the whole way and lay in the water for a little while if I needed to. Oh yeah, that'll, that'll cook you. That'll cool you down pretty quick. Yeah, nice. Yeah, that makes sense. Hey. The first day when I was getting away from Lake Superior. Uh, when I was hiking up the Mishpikotan River. At that point in time, I still had my dry suit with me uh, because my dad had my other set of clothes that he was bringing with him to meet me at the other river. Yeah. So at that point in time, I was paddling in a dry suit and hiking. And as soon as I got away from that cold water body of Lake Superior, I was just overheating big time and oh, wow. it was absolutely miserable. <clears throat> um. I, I, we had a question regarding like the, the specs of the sup and you actually showed that in the slide. And on that slide, could we, could we pause for like 20 yeah. seconds? I need the echo on my end to go away so I can hear you. Sure. Yeah, because my dad had my other set of clothes that he was bringing with him to meet me at the other river. So at that point in time, I was paddling in a dry suit and hiking. Okay. And as soon as I got away from that cold water body of Lake Superior, I was just overheating big time. Okay, I'll be able to hear you now. All right, sounds good. So um, you showed a slide which kind of detailed the specs on the boards, the, the carbon infinity board and then the C4 waterman, the different sizes. Uh, one number that we saw in there that we didn't, uh, weren't quite aware of, it looked like maybe the subs were labeled in liters. What, right. what, how does that, what is that sort of measurement in regard to the sub? Okay. So we're, we're talking about the volume of a board that people kind of get stuck thinking only about the length and width of a board, but the thickness and the volume is directly correlated to the amount of buoyancy and flotation of a board. And that's a really big thing that we need to account for because you can have a board of a certain length and width, but if it's not thick and buoyant, it's going to feel completely different in a big open water environment. Okay. Uh, now that's touring. Uh, people that will talk about surfing get even more picky about volume because surfers want to keep their board as thin as possible so they can dig into the face of a wave and carve turns. So surfers really talk about volume a lot. Kind of same thing with whitewater paddlers as well. Stop thinking only about the length and width of a board, 
but the thickness and the volume <clears throat> is directly correlated to the amount of buoyancy and flotation of a board. And that's a really big thing that we need to account for because you can have a board of a certain length and width, but if it's not thick and buoyant, it's going to feel completely different in a big open lab environment. Uh, now that's cooling. Uh, people that will talk about surfing get even more picky about volume because surfers want to keep their boards as thin as possible so they can dig into the face of the wave and hard surf. So surfers really talk about volume a lot. And same thing with white water paddlers as well. Um, another question here. Um, it appeared that maybe your stand up paddle board paddle maybe had a curve or maybe an S shape to it. Okay. Um, the, I'm not sure which part you're referring to. The, the shaft of the, the paddle shaft. is straight. The, shaft, yeah. okay. the shaft is straight. In a lot of instances, if there's a picture mid-stroke, you might see that the shaft is bending, mm -hmm. which it's designed to do. And then at the blade, so say the shaft is straight like my arm, the blade bends out this way. Yeah. Uh, the same way like a, a nice carbon flat water canoe paddle would. Sure, that makes sense. Okay. Yep. Um, uh, in, in, uh, I think it was maybe towards the end of the presentation, we saw a quick video where you were um, carrying your stuff like you normally would, walking down the beach with all the gear on it. Uh, just out of curiosity, do you have a, a kind of an overall weight of, of your rigs with the gear and everything, just out of curiosity? Honestly, I never weighed all of it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I never wanted to because it would be discouraging to have sure. the actual number. The and then you're board, trying to maybe so, Okay, it. let's talk about the carbon race board that I use on Lake Superior. That board weighs like 25 pounds. Oh, wow. The inflatable whitewater board, it weighs a little bit less than that. Yeah. I would guess my gear all weighed about 50 pounds, maybe nice. a little bit less than that. Cool. Um, at the beginning of your presentation, you talked about sort of the, um, I guess, people's perception of supping and, and sort of, um, you mentioned sort of outreach and uh, how you, um, so I'm, I'm curious how someone, you know, who might be interested in doing sup touring, sup racing or expedition, what would be some good um, uh places to visit. I obviously Superior Paddle Academy, definitely right at the top of the list, but um, hey, any other hey, resource that maybe um, you can provide or insight? The inflatable whitewater board is a little bit less than that. I would guess my gear all weighed about 50 pounds. Maybe a little bit less. Adam, I, I'm going to call you. Can okay. you tell me your question on the phone? Because I have like a triple echo right oh, now. Oh, sure. I yeah. can't hear you. This is really bad. <laughs> Ah, what's going on here? Sorry. Calling you back. <laughs> Not sure what happened there. <laughs> okay, let's try this. All right. Okay, so um, the question was, you know, in the beginning of your presentation, you talked about sort of um, sort of people's perception of supping and, and how their, you know, limited knowledge sometimes gives them a, uh, not a really good perspective on, uh, on supping or maybe they have some strange questions or just don't understand it. You mentioned outreach. So I'm curious about maybe someone who's interested in uh, pursuing sup racing or touring and expedition, um, you know, what sort of, you know, what sort of uh, avenues might someone or resources might someone uh, be helpful for someone interested in doing that? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I guess now one thing I would think of is, you know, there are many magazines, both printed and published online, that uh, they'll actually do interviews with people like myself or other uh, paddlers around the world, both world class and recreational. And there are a lot of actually just free publicly available articles online that kind of list out a lot of things I talked about, out about what sort of things you should consider when you're preparing for a journey, uh, specific things about pieces of equipment. Uh, because as I mentioned, uh, 
marketers like to be very simplistic with their marketing and try to tell people that their board is perfect for them when in reality everyone everyone is unique and everyone uh, should be looking for a unique board that suits them personally um, now the other thing uh, would be receiving specific instruction uh, you can know all about the sport and the equipment but uh, you need to know how to actually utilize all of that equipment and knowledge in a physical sense being able to take good paddle strokes understand how to apply your board skills and footwork to different water and wind environments and that stuff that uh, you know if you have a group of people that paddle you can learn from them but what i find in the midwest is there are many groups of paddlers but uh, none very few of those groups actually have had the exposure to board sport culture or paddling in more advanced environments and that internally the groups you know they're very enthusiastic people but they might just not have a full sense of the potentials and it's not because they're bad people i love everyone that goes paddling but we just generally don't have a lot of the exposure in the midwest and it is unfortunate uh, but you know my i guess my shameless plug is i do teach all of these skills in duluth i own my own company i have full fleets of whitewater stand-up paddleboard equipment, touring equipment. I take people out and I teach them all of the really refined skills that I've learned. And I have connections across the whole country if someone wants to maybe not learn from me, but they want to go learn in California or in the Rocky Mountains or the Appalachians. There are other great instructors and programs all over the place. I, the, what the paddler has to do is just be able to pick out the really good instructors from the, the programs are more formatted for uh, volume than quality. Nice. Um, one last question I have here is um, what's next? What, what kind of trip uh, or any other uh, trips coming up that you have, uh, you're you thinking about or, or have, have in the works? You know, the first time I paddled around Superior, I got done and said I was never going to do something like it again. <laughs> And then four years later, I paddled from Duluth to the ocean. <laughs> I didn't really have that salty taste in my mind at the end of the last journey. But at this point in time, I'm not necessarily planning on another big one. I am now working as a coastal engineer and I'm mostly excited about starting up Superior Paddle Academy. So I guess my next big journey, it's not necessarily going to be me pushing my limits, but it's going to be helping other people find what they're true potential with a board and paddle actually are through instruction and exposure to really fun and exciting environments. Oh, that sounds great. Uh, I'm, I will definitely be looking you up. Uh, I'm an avid supper myself and mostly an angler from a sup. Um, I've gotten some oh. ridicule out there. People being like, you're fly fishing from a sup. I'm like, yes, hey, I, I, <laughs> I took a friend fly fishing and he killed it. He actually caught some pretty nice fish. Yeah. I, I had him on one of my really wide whitewater boards. So he was super stable. Nice. And he's like six, six too. You oh, know, wow. he's, not, yeah. <laughs> he's not inherently a super stable person on a board, but he fly fished off that thing all day long and he did great. Yeah. Yeah. They make a great workstation. You can kneel down, you can hang your feet off the edge, you know, yeah, great. Um, that's all the questions that we have here. Uh, I would love to see these uh, additional videos you got. And my phone's about to die. So <laughs> I'm going to say goodbye, hang up. And if you want to cue up those videos, uh, maybe we'll just uh, end the show right after that. Does that work for you? Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Thank you so much, Jared. I appreciate your time and your information. And I uh, love sh uh, hearing about your journey. And you're uh, definitely look for forward to uh, learning more about Superior Paddle Academy. So thank you so much. Okay, great. great. Thank you. Bye. Bye.
Okay, so that was winter paddling on Lake Superior. I do offer guided winter paddling service with Superior Paddle Academy as well. I have a full fleet of dry suits, thick wetsuit boots, and everything you need. Uh, but uh, here is one final video about a whitewater stand up paddling. This one, it's a bit more rough, but you'll get the general idea. We can actually go down some pretty cool rapids. Is everyone gone now? Yes, I, I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That was awesome. Uh, yeah, that was uh, kind of tough for me. I had that weird echo thing never really went away. Yeah, I, Madison and I were trying to figure it out, and we're look, looking at all, all of our monitors, and I'm, I'm uh, without being there and seeing your setup, you know, sometimes I find that if I have a tab open, sometimes like a tab is playing in the background, and just like muting that tab or something who knows but i i couldn't hear it on the output so but i i, I understand that can be frustrating on your end just sort of the reverb <laughs> yeah yeah well yeah. yeah i was just curious if it's happened to anyone else really um we had an issue in the beginning like the first day and we realized well actually no it was our presentation last night with rod the owner he um i thought he was going to do his presentation from his office but he joined me here in the conference room and so we had six computers and so we had, <laughs> we had a serious echo chamber happening uh, but we figured it out. Thankfully, we had that time before the presentation. Um, thanks a lot. That was awesome. I've, I'm super yeah, I curious about the same echo now. I can't hear you at all. Oh, shit. <laughs> all right. Well, Jared, um, thank you. I'll connect with you after the show, okay? Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks. Take care. Have a good one. You too. Bye.